ladies and gentlemen, before we get into the full Weather Center segment, I'm actually cutting into this video and I will be deleting it and re-uploading it to my channel because I have some critical information to pass along to you that I was not able to present when I first shot this video in the morning. Unfortunately, this is a bit of a struggle that I face in my current schedule iteration. I am only able to make content as I wake up in the morning before I start my workday. Otherwise, I'm unable to do so unless it just be a live stream in the evening after everything is all said and done. But I wanted to come at you and show you the latest 12Z European model, which is projecting a much stronger solution, a dangerous solution at that, not only for the Midwest and the Great Lakes, but down here in the south and the southeast, which looks like clockwork, very reminiscent of the last system that blew through in early January, providing us with that severe weather outbreak, that tornado outbreak through the Gulf Coast and into the Florida Panhandle. This update does very well coincide with the majority of the information that I will present to you in the segment that was pre-recorded that'll come after this update. However, I just wanted to show you that as of now, the European model data that I do show you is a little bit outdated. It has swung back in the direction of a major bomb cyclone developing as we go through this upcoming weekend and early parts of next week. So as you can see here, we're on the 12Z Euro. This is 120 hours out. This is 12Z on Saturday, this upcoming weekend, February 10th. If I scroll through time, we are still anticipating cyclogenesis over central and eastern Texas, just south of Oklahoma. But you can see that the Euro at 12Z is actually identifying a 995 millibar low. And I was looking at the Cape and buoyancy values out here. And if I were SPC, I'd give this an extra 24 to 48 hours to marinate, see if this trends. And then I would go slap in 15, if not 30% on my charts because Cape is off the charts. We're looking at easily above 1,500 to almost 2,000 joules per kilogram of Cape, particularly in the central and eastern Texas area as this system kicks off. And as you can see, we have an abundance of moisture and good cold, dry air advection occurring on the backside of this. So this solution, if it holds true, that is a huge if. If this solution holds true, this is a widespread tornado outbreak for Texas in the making as we roll through this upcoming weekend as we start the day on Saturday for my Texas folks out there. And I'll very quickly go through time. I don't want to hold you guys up from the rest of this segment, but as you can see, we are back to the solution of a 985 millibar low headed into the Midwest, the Great Lakes, dropping large scale snow mounts as well as blizzard conditions and very good icing conditions as well along the leading edge of that warm sector that looks very impressive, at least again, the huge disclaimer, this current solution. The trends have been very back and forth and there's a lot of discontinuity and inconsistencies that we're still trying to iron out. So don't take this as reality, but it is worth monitoring and that's why the key takeaway in the actual segment you'll hear in a couple minutes is we're just monitoring, we're watching closely before we know anything concrete. But again, if you look at the extension of that cold boundary moving through the Midwest down into the Ohio, Mississippi Valley through Kentucky, Tennessee, down into the Gulf Coast states, this is exactly the same pattern we saw when we first had the tornado outbreak that we were chasing live on this weather channel. And you can see we have an abundance of really good warm air advection occurring out ahead of it. And what I'm a little confused about is why the models are depleting our buoyancy and our instability across the southeast because we will be warm. We will be mild. We will be moist because we are not expecting another bona fide frontal system or anything cool or dry to move past the southeast U.S. after our upper low to provide us with that cool and stabilizing trend. So this is definitely something we're watching and we'll keep you updated. All right, let's roll the rest of the segment. Welcome back to the Weather Center, everyone. Thank you very much for taking some time today to join me for this Weather Center segment. It is February 5th, 2024. Happy Monday, ladies and gentlemen. We have some good information to pass along to you guys as well as what's ahead as we approach the Valentine's Day weekend, the weekend just before Valentine's Day. It looks like we might have another potential cyclone a la a winter storm forming up somewhere in the southern plains and kicking out east and eventually northeast. If you enjoy this update video, please make sure you hit that like and share button so that way this information reaches the appropriate parties, folks who you believe will benefit from this information, as well as hit that subscribe button and turn your notifications on. If you haven't done so already, welcome to the Weather Center community and we're happy to have you guys and we will definitely continue this repetitive update rhythm that we've been making since we started February altogether. Let's cut the chit chat and fasten our seatbelts, folks, and get ready right in here. Okay, we're starting out with our Northern Hemisphere Water Vapor Satellite Shot, or our Wide Scale Water Vapor Satellite, because I wanted to highlight our cutoff low feature here that broke a lot of rules in our forecast yesterday. Storm Prediction Center and a lot of other meteorological sources, including myself, were definitely anticipating some type of severe weather phenomena on the southern side of this system, trying to pull in that deep, intense, dry air from the south, as well as some warm, moist air from the Caribbean 
DNC, which it definitely did and was successful in doing so yesterday because not only did we have multiple tornado and severe warned storms across the southern peninsula, but we had widespread reports of tornado warnings, observed funnels on the ground, as well as large hail in some areas in northern Florida spreading into southern Georgia. We're starting the day today with more severe weather looming on the horizon. As the sun comes up, we have more severe warning and special marine warnings in effect for the Florida Keys and just south of Naples headed towards Fort Lauderdale and Miami. So please be on the lookout. This video will probably release by the time that is all said and done. Well said and done, as a matter of fact, with our upload times here on the Weather Center. But regardless, if you have me on TikTok or Instagram, I've been updating you every step of the way. So we're not out of the woods just yet as this upper low tries to trudge its way down to the south east and eventually successfully exit our AOR over the Bahamas and into the western Atlantic posing no significant threat to the United States outside of the island of Bermuda. We've switched over to our Conus shot because I also wanted to take a second to highlight what's been happening along the west coast of the U.S., particularly California, where we've had very, very disastrous and catastrophic floods ongoing. I've been seeing lots of videos on social media and across YouTube all together highlighting just how bad the flooding is occurring in California, particularly for the central and northern portions of the state. But as you can see, we have very, very good onshore flow occurring over SoCal right now, particularly over San Diego, Los Angeles, the greater Southern Valley area of California. So I don't think we're out of the woods there yet either with the high winds, very incredible onshore surf conditions, as well as the heavy rainfall that could provide us with that flash flood threat for SoCal, particularly as the main area of this low begins to finally move its way into the Pacific Northwest and the Great Basin of the Central Rockies over Idaho and Montana, where we are seeing heavy, heavy mountain snowfall as we speak. So since I mentioned severe weather and that system not playing by the rules down here in the southeast, you can also see those very high wind reports scattered across the Bay Area of northern and central California, right up along the coast, as I had mentioned on that water vapor shot a moment ago. But if you look down over the southeast, not only did we have a random report of large hail close to the New Orleans area in Louisiana, but we had several hail reports. And I'm talking an inch, if not greater than an inch in size, for the northern half of central Florida with some hailstones reportedly falling in the U.S. CF area. We also had lots of damaging wind occurring down in Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Thank you for those of you who reached out to let me know you were doing okay. Longtime fellow viewers of the Weather Center sending in the great content and the update videos of your local area where we easily saw 40, 50, even in excess of 60 mile an hour winds with these convective bouts making their way through. And you can see we did have three confirmed tornadoes, not to the extent of some of these previous winter storms, but considering the threat was entirely highlighted for the southern one third of the Florida Peninsula down in in this general area, if you can see my cursor where you guys are viewing from, there was no threat nor discussion of any kind of severe weather phenomena occurring to the north of I-4, let alone in southern Georgia. Georgia was out of the mix altogether, so this system definitely broke a couple rules. Now we're moving on over to the European model, and as we go through time, you can see that upper low is expected to deepen down just a little bit more before finally rolling over top of the island of Bermuda, giving them widespread showers and high wind conditions more than likely as it continues to strengthen deepening down to as far as 994 millibars before finally exiting into the Atlantic AOR. No more of a concern for anybody here in the lower 48. We are expecting the system that is impacting California and the Pacific Northwest to finally emerge over the northern plains, providing Montana, Wyoming, the front range of Colorado, and the Dakotas more than likely some very heavy snowfall and maybe a chance at some mixed wintry precip to include icing, some kind of grapple or sleet effect, as well as some freezing rain depending on how much of the warm air over the south can make it back up and around the center of circulation as the system progresses towards the upper plains, the upper Great Lakes region. Now this here is the area in question for us here in the Weather Center. I've been mentioning for the last several updates, not only on TikTok, but here on YouTube and during previous live streams, that our cutoff lows can be very difficult to forecast. And it was proven so yesterday, especially for northern Florida, folks near Jacksonville, Daytona Beach, and into the southern periphery of Georgia. But that remains to be seen. We're almost out of the woods in terms of that category of weather phenomena. What we're looking at now is potentially our next jet-supported Barrett Clinic winter-style storm forming up as we move into this next upcoming weekend in that trademark spot of the Texas-Oklahoma panhandle. 
as we fast forward a little bit more through time, I want you guys to track it through time with me, okay? So if you look up over the Pacific Northwest, you can see another unstable wave moving in with that atmospheric Pineapple Express type setup for the Pacific Northwest, Washington State, and Oregon. As that system moves through, you see it get lost over the higher terrain of the Rockies, still providing them with some pretty good mountain snowfall. We might see a little bit of this bleed down into the lower levels if we examine the thickness here momentarily. We do have some good polar air trying to punch down towards the south, and as that system does show itself over the southern plains, very textbook with what we've seen almost all winter and even into the fall season there prior in 2023, that's where we're expecting some very good cyclogenesis. And I'll hold the clock here on this timestamp. This is 18 Zulu, Sunday afternoon. These systems almost move through like clockwork. It seems like we've mentioned a lot of Tuesday and Wednesday storm or events. We've also mentioned a lot of weekend, latter weekend events like this upper low that just moved through us. Yesterday was Sunday was the main event. It looks like the main event is once again forecast to potentially take place on February 11th for Texas, Louisiana, and further eastward throughout the Gulf Coastline. The reason I'm pausing here and I keep mentioning our cutoff low is the big distinction on the table. Our cutoff low was not necessarily jet supported, which is why it was very difficult to highlight where our severe threat really existed. In this case, we go back to what we're more or less used to. This is familiar territory for us. We have a polar front jet supported system here, and if I use my epic pen to highlight what I mean by that. We had all that good polar air and cold air coming across the Rocky Mountains, meeting up with our warm inflow of tropical air over the Gulf of Mexico, which establishes our cold, dry conveyor belt and the warm conveyor belt out ahead of it. And if I take you maybe 24 hours further into time, you can see we really start to see those conveyors show up in the form of fronts. Here is where our cold front more than likely lies in the pressure troughing to the south of our center of circulation, and our warm front is very readily identifiable with this up northern flow here, that onshore flow occurring across the Florida Peninsula, providing some stratiform rain, maybe some isolated severe weather for Georgia and the Carolinas as the system really gets going. So this is the one on my radar, guys. I really want us to pay close attention to this because the models have been very, very on the fritz with it. The GFS wasn't really calling for much. The Canadian model didn't have a single low pressure stamped on a lot of its previous model runs, but we're starting to finally see everything come into unison, and I noticed a lot of videos over the weekend, as a matter of fact, that started to highlight the initial phase of this storm and I'll go ahead and take you guys back about 24 hours so you can see exactly why there were a lot of videos suddenly surfacing about our next major east coast winter storm. So if I hold this on this timestamp here, this is as we turn the calendar page to the 13th of February. This is 0Z February 13th. You can see a 988 millibar unstable wave, a deep low pressure system right over top western Tennessee moving into Kentucky with widespread snowfall, freezing rain and icing likely occurring over Pennsylvania moving through the northeast United States as well as the Midwest and a very, very likely severe weather outbreak occurring on its southeastern quadrant. This has since dissipated and as you saw with our most recent Zero Zulu run, the Euro has backed off in intensity. And we'll take a look at the ensembles to see what the long-range ensembles are thinking as well, but we definitely want to watch this closely because we do typically see these intensification fluctuations this far out in advance. So as I mentioned, here we go with our ensembles. We're going to quickly fast forward through this. There goes that first system emerging over the northern plains, the Dakotas, Minnesota, providing them with that rainfall and heavy snow threat before pushing into the Canadian territories of Quebec headed towards James Bay, Hudson Bay. And then there over the southern plains, you can start to see that pocket of lower pressure beginning to form up. This is 0Z February 12th. And if you continue to take this through time, the general thinking is we should stay somewhere in the mid-990s in terms of our central millibar pressure with some of the ensembles members thinking we could really bomb out and get down close to that 980 millibar threshold. So that's why I'm mentioning we do want to pay attention to this. I'm not sounding the alarm on our next major winter storm, heavy snow, historic cold outbreak and snow outbreak, but we do have a lot of discontinuity between models, not only run-to-run -run with individual models like the Euro, the GFS, but if you look at model agreement from the Icon, GFS, Canadian, Euro, etc., whatever you want to put on the table, we're very lopsided right now. There really isn't a lot of confidence that this thing will even form, and the models that do want to form it keep it fairly weak, but then they windshield wiper back to worst-case scenario of this being a bomb cyclone. So we're just going to keep watching this run-to-run -run and kind of develop a little bit more confidence as we get through the middle parts of this week.
We're coming over to 300 millibars again. As I've mentioned, this low will be jet supported as well as the one that's going to kick up over the northern plains and give the northern plains, the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes region a good shot at some heavy snowfall and high wind and rainfall activity in its wake. As we take this through time, there goes our first system moving up and out. You can kind of see it in through here with all that difluent jet flow over Minnesota, moving through Wisconsin and the Great Lakes with that cold sector being up back over Montana, Wyoming, and the Dakotas. If you look just off the chart here, it might be very difficult for you guys to see it's a very small blip on the radar if you will there's our next jet max of the polar front jet this is our el nino jet our subtropical jet still readily apparent across the south this thing is not letting go it is holding on for dear life and i don't think we'll really start to wean the effects of el nino until we get towards the very end of march and throughout april we'll finally see that start to taper off and we'll come back to a more normal if you will a kind of realistically normal pattern for much of north america and central america as I fast forward, you can see that Jet Max really start to make its present known over Pac Northwest, over Nevada, moving down towards the south with all that cold air funneling through Alberta and Manitoba out of Canada. And if you continue further down the loop, you can see it finally meet up with our subtropical jet. Now, mind you, this is a positively tilted trough. So we may not see rapid intensification of our low surface reflection outside of what we see in the upper level. So this is also why we want to dig into this a little bit more. If it remains positively tilted, we won't have that explosive cyclogenesis or that very fast-paced development we've seen with previous winter storms that have gone from 1,000 millibars down to 985, 980, and even into the sub-980s as they've moved towards the Midwest and the Great Lakes. I'll go ahead and hold us steady here. This is our 0Z GFS now, and as you can see, the GFS is on board now with a bit of a nice punch of cold air moving across the eastern extent of the Great Plains into the Appalachians and the Ohio-Mississippi Valleys. And for those of you not too familiar with our 1,000 to 500 thickness, I'm I'm looking right in through here. This is where our colder values are associated with the support provided to our low pressure system. The low itself should be somewhere right in through here. If you look at these thickness lines, this is our 540 and our 528 line just upstream of where its current position is, which shows us that this is a polar front jet supported system with some decent warm air advection trying to occur out ahead of it, which is why we want to watch not only for those winter storm impacts to its north, but that severe weather threat out ahead of it because we have this more textbook, this more classic severe weather setup with our conveyors, our cold sector, our warm sector, and that difluent flow aloft where you can see these black contour lines are spreading out, fanning out just out ahead of it. And then finally, last but not least, this is our 0Z GFS. Right at the same time, you can see exactly where we highlighted it in our 1,000 to 500 thickness. We have 1,002 millibar low. Nothing too extreme. Nothing really worth writing home about just now. We're kind of in a monitoring phase. We're just kind of watching the trends, taking a look at the dynamics in play, how much of the cold air is going to come down through the Rockies and emerge over the plains, how much return flow or warm advection we're going to see over the Gulf Coast to create that area of conflict, that clashing of air masses that will really help to ramp up the strength of this low, as well as the strength of that jet max that's going to move through the pack northwest southern British Columbia. So there's always a lot of moving pieces when forecasting these systems, and that's why I don't want to come on the video today and tell you guys, look out, watch out, here it comes with a giant arrow, because we're not there yet. We still have about six to seven days before we really start to see this come to fruition, if it does, and lots of lead time to maintain a vigilant watch of our model data and our analysis data to see how the pattern shakes out, because if we do see more blockage, like we did last week, this system will come in much slower and we'll see the timing kind of adjust pretty badly. Or if we can clear out that blocking pattern, we could see this come in sooner and more rapidly intensify if we introduce another stronger bout of polar front jet energy. So that's about it, folks. We're going to go ahead and wrap the video. Thank you very much once again for tuning in. If you had the time to do so, I really appreciate all of you guys' continued support. We're going to continue to keep you posted not only on this, but the severe weather events that are still ongoing for Southern Florida. As I've mentioned, we haven't finished up that chapter of this book just yet and we have another one coming up on the horizon that we want to start to study for before it arrives and it's knocking on our doorstep if it comes to fruition we're still in that monitor mode so we'll keep you updated day by day with the live streams and these hard weather center segments throughout the next five to seven days so once again, if you liked this video, please smash that like button and share it around your social media. If you'd be wonderful enough to do me that favor, I'm really feeling good being back at the helm regardless of if views or subscribers are low. It's nice to be back providing you guys with this content, especially for my faithful viewers who have been wonderful in the live stream chats as we moved through not only the end of tropical season last year, but throughout this very erroneous El Nino winter together. 
We'll see you again very soon. And we'll be going live tomorrow night at 8 p.m. to see exactly what's going on and talk trends and confidence with this upcoming forecast in the next week or so as we start the next week, the second full week of February. But guys, until next time, this is Weather Center Nazario signing out.